Thank you, Chris, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation. So um, I would like to start by um, first wishing a happy birthday to Gilbert and Martin, and uh, second, re review uh, one of the joint theorems uh, concerning growth under iteration of a single automorphism of a free group. So let me start by setting a few notations. So Fn here is going to be a free group, and I'm going to fix uh, some free basis of Fn. And uh, when I write the norm of a, a non-trivial element of the free group, what I mean is uh, the world length of the conjugacy class of G, meaning uh, the smallest world length of uh, an element of the free group that is conjugate to uh, this element G when uh, written as a reduced word in my fixed free basis for the free group. Or in other words, if you prefer, uh, the norm of G is uh, the world length of a cyclically reduced representative of G in its conjugacy class when written in this free basis of Fn. Okay, so Levitt and Lustig have proved the following theorem that um, associated to um, any outer automorphism of the free group is uh, a finite set of uh, possible growth rates such that uh, whenever you pick a non-trivial conjugacy class of the free group, then um, the growth of G under iteration, the exponential part of the growth of G under iteration of phi is going to be given by uh, one of these growth rates, uh, lambda i. So you're going to have the following limit for one of the lambda i's. And in addition, they've proved that uh, there is a bound on the number of possible growth rates, so you have at most 3n minus 2 over 4 growth rates that are uh, strictly greater than 1. So uh, I should warn you here that uh, it's completely possible that some elements of the free group only grew uh, polynomially fast under iteration of phi, uh, in which case I just allow in the statement one of the lambda i's to be uh, equal to 1. Actually, uh, what happens is in general is that any uh, element of the free group will grow like uh, a polynomial times an exponential, and uh, actually Levitt also has results about uh, bounding the degrees of the possible polynomial part of the growth rate of G. But uh, for today, I stick to understanding the exponential part of, of the growth. So I would also like to mention that this bound here is sharp, and uh, the way Levitt and Lustig built an outer automorphism of the free group having exactly this number of growth rates is uh, by taking the surface with a single boundary component, which uh, you subdivide, as I'm doing, into uh, four whole spheres and one whole tori. So this is a surface whose uh, fundamental group is free, and if n is the rank of the fundamental group of the surface, then you can check that uh, the number of pieces in the decomposition is uh, exactly equal to this number, 3n minus 2 over 4. And then you get an automorphism of the free group having the required number of growth rates by just picking a pseudo unus of diffeomorphism on each of the pieces. And if you take them with uh, different stretching factors, then uh, you're going to achieve uh, the maximal number of uh, possible growth rates. I would also like to remark that uh, in this statement, in the particular case where phi is um, a fully irreducible automorphism of the free group in the sense you know, that no proper power of phi preserves uh, the conjugacy class of uh, a proper free factor of the free group. And um, if you assume, uh, in addition, I should say that phi is uh, non-geometric or a toroidal, uh, meaning that it cannot be realized as a pseudo unus of diffeomorphisms of a surface with boundary. So if phi is fully irreducible and non-geometric, what actually happens is that all elements of the free group are going to grow uh, exponentially fast with uh, the same exponential growth rates. So in this situation, you have uh, uh, exactly one growth rate uh, that is uh, strictly greater than one, than one, and this is usually called uh, the stretching factor of uh, your automorphism. 
Okay, so today, instead of uh, studying growth under iteration of a single automorphism of the free group, I'll address the question of growth under application of a random product of uh, automorphisms. So our setting is going to be the following. So I'm going to fix some uh, finite generating set for the group out of Fn, and uh, I'm going to form a simple random walk on, uh, out of Fn by uh, multiplying successive independent increments phi i, which are all automorphisms that you choose at random uh, uniformly among your finite set of generators. And I'm going to denote by capital phi n uh, the automorphism that I get at time n of the process after uh, n multiplication. So here, all phi i's are independent and distributed with respect to uh, the uniform probability measure on S. And now the question is, uh, if you start with a non-trivial element of the free group and apply your random product of automorphisms, what can you say about uh, the typical growth of the norm of G uh, during the process? And uh, the first theorem I like to present to you is going to be a version of the law of large numbers for the random walk on out of Fn, which tells you that uh, in this situation, you're going to have a single positive growth rate such that all non-trivial elements of the free group are going to grow uh, exponentially fast with this common growth rate lambda along a typical sample path of the random walk. So almost surely, you're going to have uh, the following limit. So it's important here to notice both that um, the growth rate lambda is uh, deterministic in the sense that it only depends on the finite generating set S that I chose for defining the process, and it does not depend on the sample path of the random walk. And uh, in addition, lambda is uniform in the sense that uh, all elements of the free group grew uh, with the same growth rate. Okay, now, now that we have uh, the law of large numbers for the random walk on out of Fn, you can ask about uh, the spread of these random variables under, uh, uh, around uh, n times their mean value. And uh, in this context, you can also prove a central limit theorem for the random walk on out of Fn, telling you that there exists a centered Gaussian law on R, such that uh, if you pick any, um, well, so actually I prove it for any uh, primitive element of the free group. So here PN denotes the set of primitive elements of the free group, which are those that belong to uh, some free basis of the free group. So if you pick any primitive element of the free group, and uh, so you look at the logarithm of the norm of phi n of g, subtract n times the mean value lambda and renormalize by a square root of n, then these random variables are going to converge in lieu towards uh, a centered uh, Gaussian lieu. So this describes you the spread of these uh, random variables around their mean value lambda. And here again, uh, the, the lieu n and the variance of n is uh, independent from the element of the free group that you choose. No, it's central limit theorem. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> th there is uh, another question that you can ask, uh, which is the following. So, uh, as a matter of fact, and this follows, for example, from work by Calegari um, and Maher or by Alessandro Sisto. If you run a, a sufficiently long uh, random walk on out of Fn, then um, eventually all the automorphisms phi n that you're going to get are going to be uh, fully irreducible and uh, non-geometric, by the way. So almost surely, eventually, all phi n are going to be uh, those, uh, one of those e whips. So e whips, in a sense, are generic in out of Fn. So in particular, the automorphism that you get at time n of the process has a well-defined uh, stretching factor. And then you can ask, 
what is the relation between the asymptotics of the stretching factor of the automorphism that you get at time n of the process and uh, the Lyapunov exponent lambda of the random walk that describes you the growth along a typical sample path. And uh, in joint work with Francois de Magny, we proved um, that you have uh, the, the convergence that uh, you would expect that almost surely, if you take the logarithm of the stretching factor and divide it by n, this is going to converge to uh, this Lyapunov exponent lambda of uh, the random walk on out of fn. So here the, there is a log that appears in the statement just because usually uh, stretching factors are defined in this uh, multiplicative fashion while uh, yeah, Poonov exponents are. We have the existence of lambda, uh, uh, this is a positivity particularly, right? Um, you need more than 20 to show that this lambda exists. No, you, you, it's not, so these variables here are not going to be subadditive in general. No, so w what a subadditive would be. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, I should say all these theorems for the simple random walk on out of Fn uh, can be viewed as analogs of uh, more classical results in the context of random products of matrices. So, uh, if instead of considering a random walk on the group out of Fn of outer automorphisms of a free group, you consider a simple random walk, say, on SL and Z, then uh, in this context, the uh, version of the Lua of large number was already proved by Fürstenberg, who proved that for a simple random walk of, on SL and Z, there's going to exist a single uh, positive growth rate such that if you pick any vector in Rn, any non-zero vector in Rn, then the growth of the norm of V uh, along uh, applying your random product of matrices is going to be uh, exponential, and all elements, all vectors in, in Rn are going to have the same um, exponential growth rate. And uh, in the linear setting, a similar central limit theorem also holds. And this here can be viewed as uh, an analog of a theorem of Givash, which tells you that uh, for a random product of matrices, basically the logarithm of uh, the top eigenvalue of the matrix that you obtain at time n of the process will satisfy the, the same uh, convergence statement. So we like to view this as a sort of spectral theorem for um, the simple random walk on out of f. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, in, in the case of mapping class groups, you, you can also ask for the same question. So, here what you want to do is, so you have, say, S is uh, a closed hyperbolic surface. So, you equip it with uh, some hyperbolic metric. And now what you can do is pick a simple closed curve on the surface apply a, a random product of mapping glasses of the surface, of diffeomorphisms of the surface, and try to understand the growth of the hyperbolic length of uh, a geodesic representative of C uh, along your uh, random product of mapping classes. And yes, yeah, so in, in this context, the version of the Lua of large numbers was uh, already proved by uh, Anders Carlsen, and actually uh, Carlsen's work was a real source of inspiration for proving th this version for out of f. And so Carlsen proved, well, the same kind of things that you have a single growth rate, single positive growth rate, and all simple closed curves on the surface are going to grow exponentially fast with uh, this same growth rate, lambda. Um, along typical sample path of uh, the random walk on mod S. And yeah, it's true that uh, in this situation, I could also establish a central limit theorem for, um, for these variables here, the, the, same, the same statement. And also in our work with Francois, we uh, established the analog of the spectral theorem for uh, the random walk on mod S. So here, what, what happens is that uh, if you run a sufficiently long uh, random walk on the mapping class group of S, then eventually all the diffeomorphisms that you're going to get are going to be uh, pseudo-unus of diffeomorphisms of the surface, so pseudo-unus of our generic in mod S, 
And, and so they have a well-defined stretching factor, and the exact same convergence statement holds in this setting. OK. Yeah, so you have the, the analogous results for mapping class groups of surfaces. OK, let, let me come back to uh, the case of um, out of Fn. So for, for the moment, we've seen kind of two opposite situations. So in the case of matrices, is there a, like a full spectrum of them, like not just the top line of the Oh, for, for, for matrices, yes, yes. Yeah, you give, give us theorem, uh, yeah. The, the whole spectrum converges to the whole set of Lyapunov exponents. Uh, yeah, generically it's simple, generically. Okay, so for, for out of Fn, we, we've seen two kind of opposite situations. So Le leviton lustig theorem was about iterating a single automorphism of the free group. And these theorems over there are uh, about uh, growth along simple random walls on the whole group out of Fn. More uh, generally, what you can do is uh, pick your favorite finite gener fin finitely generated subgroup of out of Fn and uh, consider a simple random walk that is confined on this uh, proper subgroup of out of Fn. So this case here would be the case where H is the whole group out of Fn, and this, and levitt lustig theorem, would be the case where H is the, just a cyclic subgroup, and your process consists in choosing the same automorphism with probabili probability 1 at each step of the wall. But, so, so in general, you cannot expect to have a, a single growth rate for all elements of the free group just because of this here and there. But uh, in general, you can still say uh, the following, that um, in this situation, there's going to exist a, a finite tree of uh, subgroups of the free group. So here, all the nodes of my tree are subgroups of Fn and uh, edges stand for inclusion, and associated to each of the nodes of my filtration of Fn by subgroups is a some growth rate. And now, whenever you pick an element of the free group that is conjugate into one of the nodes of the filtration, but not into um, any descendant of this node, then the growth of G along a typical sample path of the random walk is going to be given precisely by uh, the growth rate associated to this uh, particular subgroup lambda i. So almost surely you're going to have the following limit. This AI have a three factors or just one? No, just finitely generated subgroups in general, yeah. But yeah, they, they have some. Uh, nice um, properties. So th th there are going to be basically uh, elliptic subgroups in some R tree, oh. some Fn R tree. And, and basically, there are going to be subgroups of, uh, of, of the free group which are, uh, whose conjugacy class is H invariant. Yeah. So, so yeah, I should say all these data here is, uh, again, deterministic in the sense that uh, they only depend on H and on the finite generating set of H that you chose for uh, defining the process. And yeah, the AIs are going to be um, H invariant. Sorry? A H is uh, the, the finite subgroup of, the, the finitely generated subgroup of out of Fn on which uh, the random walk is located. Uh, if H uh, no, no, uh, no. Well, no, b because well, except, except possibly in the geometric setting where you have one special conjugacy class, but but no. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to have any H invariant subgroup. Uh, yeah. So these AIs, the conjugacy classes are H invariant. Yes. Yes. And uh, as in Levitt and Lustig's theorem, you, you can get uh, the same bound on uh, the number of possible positive growth rates 
that arise in uh, this filtration. Well, actually, this band was really inspired by uh, Levitt and Luster's work. OK, so uh, let me come back to the case of a simple random walk on the whole group out of Fn. And um, I'd like to present you some of the techniques that are used for proving these various statements. So actually, uh, the proofs are really geometric group theoretic in the sense that they're going to take advantage of uh, the dynamics of the out of Fn actions on some nice spaces such as Kerber and Bachmann's outer space or uh, several hyperbolic complexes. So for example, my, my proof of um, the Lou of large numbers for the random walk on out of Fn relies on a description of the horobandery of uh, Keller and Vogman's outer space. So let me first review the construction of the horobandery of uh, a proper geodesic metric space, which uh, is due to Gramov, and, and then explain you how horobandaries can be helpful for understanding uh, random walks on groups, and in particular on out of Fn. Okay, so we have our metric space X. Let me fix some base point in X, and uh, we want to construct a sort of metric compactification of the space X. So to do this, we're going to associate to uh, any point in the space a continuous function, let's call it CZ, sending any point in the space just to its distance to Z. And I'm going to renormalize these maps by subtracting the distance from the base point uh, to Z. Now, uh, when X is proper in geodesics, this turns out to be a uh, topological embedding of X into this space of continuous functions when this is equipped with uh, the topology of uniform convergence on compact subsets of X. And in addition, uh, the closure of the image of this embedding is going to be compact, and this is the so-called, uh, this gives you the so-called horror function compactification of the space X. So basically what happens is that you know, if you take a sequence of point Z and it's escaping any compact subset of X, uh, then uh, if you take limits of the map CZ in, you're going to get a, a limiting function, which is uh, wh what you call a horror function on the space X. So maybe the typical example to keep in mind for intuition is, uh, the, case, is the case where uh, X is uh, the hyperbolic plane H2, which I'm drawing using the Poincaré disk model, in which case, as a matter of fact, the uh, horobandary of H2 is uh, isomorphic to uh, the usual circle at infinity. And basically, a point in the boundary defines you uh, a horror function, a function, some function, some horror function on X, and the level sets of this horror function are going to be uh, the classical horospheres from hyperbolic geometry. And because of our choice of free normalization, uh, basically the, the, the horosphere passing through the base point is going to be the zero level set of H. And then you can check that as you are approaching H, then the values of uh, the horror function go to uh, minus infinity. OK, so how can horror boundaries be helpful for uh, studying random works on groups, well, this is because of a theorem of Carlson and Le Drapier, which tells you that if you now have a group acting by isometries on X, then uh, if you run a random, a random work on the group G, you can, of course, realize it via the action as a random work on the space X. And uh, Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem is going to uh, tell you that almost every sample path of the realization of the random work in the space X is going to be um, directed at infinity by uh, some function in the horror boundary in the sense you know, that the speed at which uh, the realization of the random work is going to escape balls centered at the origin is going to be equal to the speed at which the random work is entering horribles for the horror function H. And this, this is exactly the intuition that the random world is kind of directed at infinity by this uh, horror function. So let me write down uh, Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem precisely. So 
So we have, so you finitely generated group acting by uh, isometries on our proper geodesic metric space X, and we are considering a left a simple random walk on G, then uh, almost surely there's going to be, there's going to exist some function in the Huru function compactification of X such that uh, the speed at which uh, the random walk is uh, escaping the base point. So I'm writing here this as a right action of G because, uh, well, the action of out of F and on out of space is going to be a right action. So let's, let me write it this way. So this limit, so this is the speed at which you are escaping the base point. This is usually called the drift of the random walk. And here existence comes from a subjectivity of these uh, quantities. This speed is also equal to the speed at which you are entering horribles for uh, the horror function H. And here there is a minus sign because uh, remember as you are approaching H, the, the values of the horror function go to minus infinity. So uh, we're going to prove the law of large numbers for the simple random walk on out of Fn basically by applying Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem to uh, the out of Fn action on uh, Keller and Wachmann's outer space. So I need a description of the horror boundary of uh, Keller and Wachmann's outer space. So let me first uh, review, the, review the definition of this space. So outer space can be defined as the space of all three minimal, simplicial, and uh, isometric actions of the free group on uh, simplicial metric trees and uh, these actions have to be considered up to um, equivariant homothetic. So here minimal just means that you have no uh, proper invariant subtree. So a point in outer space is a, a simplicial tree equipped with uh, edge length and with an action of the free group. So for example, we could choose as a base point in outer space the Cayley tree for, the free, for our free group with respect to our favorite generating set for the free group and say all edge lengths are equal to one. Now out of F and acts on the right on outer space simply by uh, precomposing uh, the F and actions. Okay, so we have uh, out of space as a set equipped with its out of f and action. I need to define you uh, a metric on out of space. And uh, yeah, let, let me first say that uh, whenever you have a tree in out of space, then the quotient space by the f and action is going to be uh, some finite graph with fundamental group uh, fn. And because I'm considering uh, the actions up to homothetic, I can uh, always find a representative of T such that this quotient graph has uh, volume one. So I will often identify T with its covolume one representative. Now, uh, whenever you pick a, a non-trivial element of the free group, then G is going to act uh, as a hyperbolic isometry of the tree, meaning it's going to have some uh, translation axis some by infinite line that is left invariant, and uh, the translation length of G in the tree is just the infimal displacement of uh, a point in the tree under the action of G. And now the, the distance between two trees in outer space is uh, going to measure the maximal amount of stretching of the norm of some element when passing from the tree T to the tree T prime. So this can be defined as the logarithm of the supremum of all non-trivial elements of the ratio of the translation length of G in uh, T and T prime. And as a matter of fact, and this is actually going to be important in the sequel, here you can compute the distance between two trees by uh, only considering translation lengths of uh, primitive elements of the free group, those which are part in some free basis of effort. 
did, oh yeah, I, I should warn you that this metric on outer space is uh, unfortunately not symmetric in the sense that the distance from t to t prime is not always equal to the distance from t prime to t, but um, actually this is not going to be a problem for what I want to do because uh, you can still define the horror boundary of an asymmetric metric space and uh, Carson and Le Drapier's theorem also works in the uh, asymmetric setting. Okay, so we, we have uh, outer space equipped with this metric and now we want to describe the uh, horror boundary of um, outer space. So there is a classical way of compactifying outer space which consists in embedding outer space into a space of projective length functions by mapping any tree to the collection of all translation lengths uh, of uh, elements of the free group in the tree T. And this map turns out to be injective in the sense that any tree is characterized by the collection of all translation lengths of elements of the free group in the tree. So this was proved by uh, Köhler and Morgan, and actually they proved that this is a homeomorphism onto its image, and the closure of the embedding is compact. So you get a way of uh, compactifi compactifying uh, outer space. And points in the boundary have uh, a pretty nice description. So points in the interior of outer space where Fn actions on simplicial trees now points in the boundary can still be interpreted in terms of f and actions on trees, but uh, the trees are no longer going to be simplicial, they are going to be R trees, and uh, the actions may uh, fail to be free, you may have some big point stabilizers. But anyway, the closure of outer space was um, identified by Cohen and Lustig and Besvina and Fein with uh, the space of all minimal, very small Fn actions on R trees. Very small is just a condition and possible um, R can try but stabilizers in the tree. Again, up to equivariant homotheory. So we have this cl classical way of compactifying outer space. Unfortunately, this compactification is not going to be isomorphic to uh, the horror function compactification that we are looking for. And the reason for this is because of this observation here that uh, the distance in outer space only retains translation lengths of primitive elements of the free group. So if you want to get the, the horror function compactification of outer space, you'd better look only at translation lengths of primitive elements of the free group. And if you do this construction with primitive elements, then you get a new compactification which is actually not isomorphic to the previous. And now, it is true that uh, the horror function compactification of outer space is isomorphic to this uh, primitive compactification of um, outer space. And in addition, we have uh, a good uh, formula for horror functions in the boundary. So uh, remember, so the the boundary was constructed by first embedding outer space into uh, this space of continuous functions, sending a tree T to uh, the function CT that mapped a tree S to uh, so the distance from S to T, which uh, I'm rewriting using the expression of the distance in outer space, minus uh, the distance from the base point. To t. But this formula again makes sense if t is a tree uh, in the closure of outer space. Not only a simplicial tree, but it also works for trees in the boundary. So you actually get a map from the usual closure of outer space to uh, the horror function compactification of outer space. And now, because the supremum here can be taken over the set of primitive elements, this map is going to factor through uh, the primitive compactifications of outer space. And the theorem is that the uh, maps you get in the quotient is um, going to be an isomorphism between the two uh, compactifications of outer space. OK. Yeah, I should also say, so you can describe uh, the fibers of this map from the closure of outer space to uh, what's happening. 
losing. Yeah, yeah you, you can describe the, the fibers of this map which consists in identifying two trees whenever they have the same uh, translation length functions in restriction to uh, primitive elements of the free group. And um, it turns out that this map is not always one-to-one, -one, but still it's one-to-one -one in restriction to big subspaces of the closure of outer space. For example, it's one-to-one -one in restriction to the set of trees with dense orbits in uh, the closure of outer space. Okay. So uh, let me uh, explain you how to conclude the proof of uh, the law of large numbers for uh, out of Fn from uh, Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem together with this description of the horror boundary of outer space. Okay, so I, I'm going to denote by uh, lambda the drift of uh, the realization of the random walk on outer space. And uh, what I'm actually going to prove is that all elements of the free group grew uh, exponentially fast along typical sample path of the random walls. And the growth rate is given by uh, the drift of the realization of the random walk. So uh, the first observation to make is that uh, just by definition of the drift, the speed at which the realization in outer space of the random wall escapes the base point is uh, linear, and the linear speed is equal to lambda. So the distance from the base point to its fin image grows uh, linearly at speed lambda. But now if you look at the definition of the metric on outer space, because we have a supremum here over all elements of the free group, this implies that the growth of any element along a sample path of the random wall can be at most exponential with exponential rate lambda. So this implies that the norm of G in the VN image of O uh, grows at most exponentially fast with exponential growth rate lambda. But this, by definition of the action, is nothing but the translation length of phi n of g in the base point, and because the base point was uh, the Cayley tree for the free group, this is what I call the norm of uh, phi n of g. So this grows at most exponentially fast. And now we are left proving that this also grows at least exponentially fast with uh, growth rate lambda. And it's here that we're really going to use the information provided by Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem, telling us that uh, our sample path is going to be directed at infinity by some horror function, which uh, is a function on this form for some tree in the closure of outer space. Uh, okay, so yeah, you, you, well, yeah, you, you need an, a f further argument to know that the drift is positive. So, so, so basically. Uh, what you do for proving that the drift is positive is uh, project the realization of the random walk to the free factor complex, and you are in a hyperbolic complex, and then uh, you have work by uh, Caligari and Maher, basically, that tells you that the drift there is going to be positive, and therefore it's also positive in outer space. Yes, yeah, so, so this is how we know the drift is going to be positive. Okay, so we have now our limiting horror function CT, and uh, so let me uh, rewrite the, the statement in Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem using uh, this expression for uh, the horror functions in outer space. So we have that minus one over n times uh, this applied to the phi n image of O, so this is logarithm of the supremum of the norm of G in T over the norm of G in the phi and image of O minus the logarithm of the supremum of the ratio between T and the base point. This uh, converges to lambda, and therefore uh, for uh, n sufficiently large, it's going to be greater than lambda minus a small quantity epsilon. So let me rewrite this in this way. OK, now wh what does this mean? We have a supremum. So for Oh. So, yeah, yeah, it's, but here you have a supremum over all elements of the free group. Yeah. You have an element G, and it means this. 
<laughs> no, he, here it's not fixed. Here it's a supremum over, yeah. You want me? Okay. But this means that for every element g prime, the ratio of g prime in t over, uh, so this is the norm of phi n of g prime, this is always going to be smaller than exponential minus n uh, lambda minus epsilon times some constant coming from this uh, term here, which is independent on n. And if you rewrite this, this tells you that for every element, the norm of phi n of g prime is uh, greater than 1 over c exponential n lambda minus epsilon times uh, the norm of g in t. So you have the exponential growth with exponential growth rate, at least uh, lambda, as desired. Except that I haven't told you why uh, the norm of g in, in the tree is uh, positive, so why g is not uh, elliptic in, in t, and it's here that you need to use that uh, we are considering a simple random walk on the whole group out of fn. So you have new uh, subgroup of fn that is invariant under the support of uh, the measure. In general, if you had uh, a subgroup of fn invariant under the support of uh, the random walk, then it could be that this subgroup is elliptic in the limiting tree that you get. But if you are considering a simple random walk on out of fn, then this is always going to be positive, and therefore uh, you get uh, the, the limit that you want. You get exponential growth. Okay, so this finishes the proof of uh, the law of large numbers for the random walk on out of fn. Now, if you want to prove uh, a central limit theorem for the random walk, well, you actually need to get more precise deviation estimates for the realization of uh, the random walk on outer space. And actually here, Carlson and Le Drapier's theorem is not enough for getting the required deviation estimates. So uh, you need another strategy. And the other strategy consists in using the fact that um, not only does out of fn act on outer space, but it also acts on some hyperbolic complexes, like the free factor complex. And actually, deviation estimates are easier to establish for the realization of the random walk in the free factor complex. So you first establish them there, and then uh, you, need to, uh, you need a way of lifting the estimates that you got to the realization of the random walk on outer space. And it's the same kind of strategy that we use in our work with Francois for uh, proving the spectral theorem for uh, the random walk on out of fn. So now in, in the remaining of my talk, i like uh, to sketch you a proof of uh, the spectral theorem for uh, the random walk um, on out of fn to uh, illustrate the strategy. So remember, we want to prove that uh, almost surely the logarithm of uh, the stretching factor of the automorphism that you obtain at time n of the process, which is fully irreducible, uh, divided by n, this is going to converge to um, the Lyapunov exponent lambda. And now we know that this is uh, also the drift of the realization of the random walk on outer space. So how do we prove this? Well, um, first, these quantities here, the logarithm of the stretching factor of phi n, have um, a nice geometric interpretations. So this is actually nothing but uh, the translation lengths of phi n acting on outer space. So as a matter of fact, any um, fully irreducible automorphism acts on outer space with uh, some translation axis. So it leaves invariant sum by infinite geodesic. And uh, the translation length of uh, phi n is uh, equal to the logarithm of the stretching factor of phi n. So the picture is uh, the following. OK, so we are, uh, we are uh, realizing uh, a sample path of the random wall on outer space. 
So here is uh, the origin, here is its Fian image, and somewhere in the picture, we have the axis of our uh, fully irreducible Fian. Now, we already know by definition of the drift that the distance here from the base point to its Fian image behaves like uh, lambda n. And we want to prove that um, the translation length of phi n also behaves like lambda n. So you will notice that it's going to be enough to prove that the distance between the base point and the axis is uh, sublinear in n and very small compared to lambda n. Because in this situation, uh, well, the distance from the base point to its phi n image will give you a good estimate for uh, measuring the translation length of phi n. So our goal. Oh, on the front. Our goal is to prove that, uh, well, so the distance between the base point and the axis, and yeah, and also the distance from the axis to the base point, because the metric is not symmetric, this is uh, sublinear in N. And as I said, uh, the strategy is going to be to use the fact that out of Fn also act on uh, the free factor complex, which is a hyperbolic simplicial complex. And uh, so, so hyperbolicity was proved by Bezvina and Fein. And in addition, you have a well-behaved projection map from out of space to the free factor complex, which is coarsely Lipschitz and uh, sends a good collection of geodesics in outer space to uh, quasi-geodesics in the free factor complex, maybe up to reparameterization. So this maps some geodesics in outer space to uh, maybe reparameterized quasi-geodesic in the free factor complex. And uh, actually what we're going to do is uh, that we're going to start by proving this fact here not for the realization of the random work on outer space, but for its realization in the free factor complex. So we project the realization of uh, our random walk, and uh, the first step of the proof first step of the proof, and this uh, actually follows from work by uh, Mayer and Tiozu, is uh, to realize that uh, the distance between uh, the base point and the axis of phi n in the free factor complex, so this is the distance in the free factor complex, this is uh, sublinear in n. Yeah, so as a matter of fact, a fully irreducible acts uh, as a log-to-dynamic isometry of the free factor complex, and therefore he does a well-defined uh, quasi-axis in, in the free factor complex. And, and, and we prove that, yeah, you, you have the picture that, that I've drawn, that here this axis passes uh, close to the base point. So uh, let me maybe draw a picture to uh, convince you that uh, this holds to all true. So, Remember, phi n was defined by uh, successive multiplications of n independent increments. Now, phi n inverse is uh, the product of the inverses of these increments in the reverse order. OK, now we have our uh, base point in the free factor complex. How do I reach uh, the, f the image of O by uh, phi n inverse? Well. I start by applying phi1 inverse, then apply phi2 inverse on the right, and then you continue till you reach phi n inverse applied to the base point. Now, uh, where is the phi n image of O on the picture? When to reach it, you start by applying little phi n, then apply little phi n minus 1, and so on and so on. And the key observation here is that the first increments in the product that defines phi and inverse are independent from the first increments in the product that defines phi n. 
So in a sense, the uh, initial path of the, the orange and the blue path have uh, nothing to do with each other. So because you are in a hyperbolic space, this uh, will force them to uh, rapidly start diverging. And once they start diverging, because you are in a hyperbolic space, they are never going to meet again. So, yeah, so the overlap here between these two paths will tend to be uh, very small compared to the distance between the base point and its phi and image. Or if you want, th this gram of product here is, is, very, is sublinear in N, actually. And, and this is exactly what you need in a hyperbolic space to know that the distance from the base point to the axis of phi N uh, is very small compared to the distance from the base point to its phi and image. So this is how basically you establish this fact here. And then in a, a second step of the proof, you need to lift this property to uh, the realization of the random walk on uh, Kohler and Volkmann's outer space. And uh, the very rough idea is that Though outer space is not a hyperbolic space, still, in a sense, typical directions in outer space will tend to have uh, hyperbolic-like properties. So what does this mean? Let, let me denote by uh, two uh, a geodesic ray from the base point to uh, the limiting point of uh, my uh, sample path. So uh, what we prove is that um, the geodesic ray too kind of uh, satisfies a, a sort of contraction property. And uh, the, the key property we use for, uh, for uh, showing our result is uh, the following, that uh, there exists uh, some constant such that almost surely the uh, geodesic ray 2 contains infinitely many subsegments having the following property that uh, whenever you pick any uh, other geodesic segment in outer space, if uh, i and j have the same projection in uh, the free factor complex in the sense that their pi images uh, remain at bounded Hausdorff distance from one another, then actually J has to pass close to I in outer space, a distance at most uh, D where D is fixed once and for all. So what does this mean on the picture? So this means that so on your ray 2, you have infinitely many little subsegments like this. Actually, it's even better. You have a positive density of uh, such uh, subsegments. And now, uh, so here are the projections in the free factor complex. And then whenever you have another geodesic segment in outer space with uh, closely the same projection as this one, then uh, it's going to have to pass close to i in outer space. But, you know, the axis of phi n contain uh, also subsegments with the same projections, just because we already know from step one that uh, the projection of the axis of phi n is close to this geodesic ray, and therefore this forces uh, the, this, the axis of phi n to pass close to uh, these little subsegments on uh, the GRS Cray 2. And this is exactly what you need to lift uh, this property to the realization of the random walk on outer space and, and prove that, uh, uh, well, you have this, the, the distance in outer space between the base point and the axis of phi n is uh, sublinear in N. And this is uh, what we needed for proving uh, the spectral theorem for uh, the realization of the random walk on out of F. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you.
question about uh, the, your main, your theorem one, if you yes. throw in more generators for odd of n, would the lambda become bigger or smaller typically? Or in other words, is there some kind of best generating system where the lambda is biggest or smallest? I don't know. I don't know. Well, so, so definitely the lambda depends on the generating set that you choose, but I mean, no, I have no good way of estimating lambda in terms of gen the generating set. Questions? Uh, is it possible to get numeric estimations for lambda? But I don't know the answer to that. I haven't really. uh, yeah, so these lambda is here are algebraic. But no, uh, I would suspect not. We, oh, well, I don't know, actually, in the case of uh, I, I actually don't know, but uh, see, so you could you could actually define any kind of random processes on out of F n and choose more general measures, to just the uniform measure on the generating set, so you can get any any kind of lambda doing this. Uh, I don't know if with a finite generating set this forces lambda to be algebraic, but. I don't see any reason why it would be so. For matrices? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I don't know any statement of this kind. Okay, thank you. Come here.